Welcome everyone. I've been asked to introduce someone who needs no introduction to this audience. She has already participated in six other clinical and research sessions this conference for various NBIA disorders, but it is only fitting that she is our speaker for this last session. Of course, it is Dr. Susan Hayflick, Professor of Molecular and Medical Genetics, Pediatric and Neurology at Oregon Health and Sciences in Portland. She is also the director of our Scientific and or Medical Advisory Board for MBIA Disorders Association. Dr. Hayflick will provide an overview of the MBIA research landscape, commentary on the diverse impacts of COVID-19 on our community, and discuss the advances we may see near and far in NBIA science and clinical care. I'll now turn the session over to Dr. Hayflick. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, Patty. Uh, there's always new people to meet. Um, I am uh, feeling a bit exhausted after four days of the meeting, although I think that the overall the, um, the virtual meeting has actually been uh, successful well beyond anything I could have uh, imagined. So kudos to all of you who did the hard work in uh, getting, us, um, getting us set up for this. I usually write my talks very close to the time I give my talks. And so whatever Patty just told you I was gonna say may or may not be, <laughs> be what I'm gonna say. But the good news is that I'm, I'm uh, pretty much doing the, uh, doing the wrap up. And so whatever I say, um, we then close it up and, and go our separate ways. So there's not too much time to throw tomatoes. I will say, Patty, just so you're listening, I'm probably not gonna take my full hour um, if I do. It's because I'm pontificating too much, but I think I, I think it will be actually quite a bit shorter than uh, the hour that I was given. Um, I do unpaid um, service for three organizations, including two that you know well, and a third, the spoon bill that you may know uh, well also. I wanna start by acknowledging where we are, which is um, worldwide pandemic. I don't need to tell anybody here that. Um, it's been a very, it's really been a, 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 a year and then some, a year and three months beyond uh, tragic, um, still heartbreakingly tragic um, in parts of the world. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that this is something that we're all still very much living with. Uh, in certain countries, we see some signs of optimism. Uh, in others, uh, things are uh, as bad as they've ever been. And so, this has um, really been a, 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 a global tragedy. And many of us have lost uh, uh, friends and family from this uh, virus. Many of us have lost friends and family members from an NBIA disorder over the past two years since we were last together. And so I want to acknowledge that really the tragic loss of children, which uh, can, never be, uh, can never be tolerated just the most painful, the most painful loss any of us can imagine. Um, in addition to those losses, the the pandemic has really, I think, more than anything else, harmed harmed children. Um, it's harmed people at all stages of life and at all in 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 many ways that we can not even imagine. But I think that we will see measurable me measurable challenges for children, uh, especially children with special healthcare needs like. Uh, many of the family members, um, your family members, uh, for having lost services and lost access to services uh, over this past uh, year that was really an important part of them um, maintaining their, their state of, of health. And so I just want to acknowledge that, that that's something that um, is uh, blind uh, to, to what type of NBIA disorder you have. It's something that we all share. On a positive note, um, it's really science that has um, shown us the way out of this pandemic. I would offer that it's science that helped us to put the lid on the pandemic, that is mask wearing, distancing, those, the knowledge that we gained from uh, the scientific experiments telling us that mask wearing and distancing lessened the spread, staying outdoors, eating outdoors, visiting outdoors, those things lessen the spread. That was that science at work. Um, and what, what really has accelerated our emergence from this 
pandemic, though I do want to be sensitive to the fact that not all countries are emerging yet. I do think over the next year, most countries will emerge. It's been science that uh, helped us develop the vaccine in a, in a way that has never been done before, at a pace that has never been done before. And I wanna call out um, one woman scientist uh, working uh, in isolation at Penn, uh, and then in collaboration uh, at Penn and, and, and ultimately with, uh, with pharmaceutical companies to develop mRNA, the, the concept of an, of an mRNA vaccine. So both the Pfizer vaccine against the coronavirus and the, uh, uh, sorry, the Pfizer Bio BioNTech uh, vaccine and the Moderna vaccines, both of those are, are based on the science that was uh, sort of pushed, conceived and, and promoted by this one uh, woman who also is an immigrant to, um, to the United States. Um, and without her creative thinking and her persistence in knowing that she had a good idea, despite having hit you know, barrier after barrier, both in her academic career and, uh, and in uh, the science, the actual science posed obstacles. She persisted in thinking that this was a very promising path and ultimately prevailed and gave us, gave the world an mRNA vaccine in partnership with others. I also wanna le leave the topic of the pandemic on a slightly higher uh, note that I do think that we will emerge from this again globally, I think over the next year, maybe a little bit longer in some of the um, developing parts of the world. Uh, and we will find we will find our feet again. We will uh, learn to live with a coronavirus, whatever it, whatever shape it, it takes with new pandemics. I think we will be uh, ready for other pandemics and we will find our our path forward. And so one of the um, good things to come out of the pandemic is that, that this association, the NBI Disorder Association, was nimble and pivoted and read the tea leaves right, that we weren't going to be, uh, you know, this, this pandemic wasn't no big deal and that we weren't, it wasn't going to go away fast, but in fact, it was going to persist. And the, as the scientists predict, it was going to take a while to emerge from. And they created a virtual meeting for us, which I think has been um, immensely uh, impactful. It's been a, really a huge success. It has opened the door to, uh, uh, to virtual access to this meeting in years to come. And I think that that makes us better and stronger because it opens us to a wider participation. And so um, I don't know if anybody from Kazakhstan did join, but if somebody from Kazakhstan wanted to join, they could join just as easily as somebody from Oregon or Ohio or Ontario or a European country. So that was a big, big success of this group. And this is a kind of a round of applause to you all. Uh, I know the board, um, uh, many of the members, the, the sort of senior leaders in the NBI Disorders Association have worked tirelessly over the last year to make this possible. And I would say it's been a really a, a, an unparalleled success. So good on, good on you for that. So in looking ahead to where things are going, it's always helpful for me to look back um, a little bit. And uh, Patty, I don't know if you have this uh, picture. I know it's an incredibly poor quality uh, photo. This is before there were iPhones and we all had them. This is a time when uh, it was probably a, a picture somebody took and then I took a picture of their picture. Um, but I can still, this is the first scientific meeting we had. It was on the heels of the first, I'm sorry, the first family meeting we had, it was on the heels of the first scientific we meeting we just had. Uh, it was a very exciting time for me, this um, person here, in um, starting to feel like we were gaining some momentum. I'd established a collaboration uh, with uh, a very prominent group of uh, scientists in California. Patty and I had uh, sort of talked about the wisdom of her uh, creating a family organization. We got the NIH to fund a, a scientific meeting and we brought families together. Actually, this is an international group. We had people from Europe, South America, uh, the UK, United Kingdom um, and beyond. Uh, Patty and her vast entourage are here. Kimby, uh, 
uh, here, and some of you may recognize others. There's a few others in that group that I recognize. This is back when we called the, the thing Hollywood and Spot syndrome. And if you maybe have heard that term, but you don't really know what it is, or you don't know how to kind of put it in context, that's kind of amazing to me that, that, that we, we've, we've almost, we're almost losing the, the kind of history of, of that term, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Many of you know that we, we moved from uh, Hollywood and Spatz syndrome to NBIA disorders because th this is um, named after two German neuropathologists, both of whom uh, were involved in uh, really unconscionable activities during, during World War II um, and the lead up to it. And there was a strong push by the neurology community in particular uh, the pediatric neurology community to discredit these two men and rename the disease. And so we uh, waited until we had a sensible thing to rename it to, and then we uh, moved to a different name. But it's helpful to kind of think sort of side by side from, from whence, we've, whence we've come. Um, I may be one of the few among you, though I'm sure I'm not the only one with uh, one of these older um, t-shirts. Uh, showing showing the um, kind of the old logo. And what struck me here is that we've changed our goals from hope to discovery. That was our original goal. We've now kind of gotten more bold and we've said it's, you know, it's not good enough to go from hope to discovery. We got to go from discovery to cure. And so I think that those two sort of side by side uh, I, that's very emblematic. I also think um, neurodegeneration with brain iron accumulation is a term that is solidly embedded in the medical literature now and is it, it, in, in another generation, Hollywood and Spatz will, will kind of be relegated to the history books. It already largely is. So we've come a long way. Um, I did wanna just show a picture um, so I started working on NBIA disorders in 1990, 1991. Um, I moved to Oregon in 93. We found the PANK2 gene, the PECAN gene in 2000, in 2000, published it in 2001. And this, we used to go on a lab hike every year. And this was uh, my lab group, plus a few others, mentors and uh, friends who, who went on a hike with us in the Oregon, uh, in the Columbia Gorge. You can see the Columbia River, the mighty Columbia. Uh, down here uh, and me with my long hair and uh, looking a bit more fit than I am these days. So when we look back, it kind of helps us frame things for, for looking, looking forward. And one of the things that helps me in sort of thinking about where we've come from and where we're headed, where we're headed in these disorders is to actually, um, it's like gathering your children at a family, family reunion. I gather our diseases, if you will. And, you know, there's always a debate about what's in and what's out. Well, is acerula plasmodemia in? And I'm not particularly interested in those kinds of discussions because they don't really matter in the end. Um, anybody who wants to be at an NBIA disorders meeting and feels like they should be here, you're, you're part of us, you're part of this family. But it does help me to kind of look back over from whence we've come and to see the delineation. We used to call this thing Hollywood and Spot syndrome. Now we call it the NBIA disorders. And within that, so we're all under a common umbrella, right? We're all together here, but um, we each have our own focus on one of these disorders or um, for some of us on uh, none of these disorders. So I wanna make a kind of a deliberate call out here to the fact that there are people in our community who know they belong, know that this is, this, is, this is the right community, this is the right place to be, but we don't actually have a disease um, answer for them yet, and that their quest, their journey continues. So we're all at different stages in this journey, right? Some of us are, when is the therapy coming? And others, we don't know, we don't even know what the MPAN protein does. So it's like we're all at different stages. It's like we're all growing up at different rates here. Some people don't even have that first answer. And so there are still on the diagnostic odyssey that many of you were on, some for few years, uh, some for many years. And to, to be ever 
ever empathetic of the fact that some people still don't have an answer. We don't give up. Um, we continue, we, have, we do exome analyses, genome analyses. Someday we'll do methylome analyses and somebody suggested we do the 4-phosphopantothenolome. We, we, will, we will continue to hunt because we feel a commitment to each and every one of you uh, in, in helping you to get beyond the diagnostic odyssey to an answer, um, even if it means you have a disorder where there's only one person in the world uh, that we know of with it. So I don't wanna spend my time going through in detail the awesomeness of what has happened in the last two years with each one of the NBI disorders. You've been in the meetings, you've been in the, and if you haven't been, you can watch the recorded sessions to hear from the scientists, from the family members and their interactions. You can hear where things, where things are headed and get a, get a catch up uh, from those. So what I wanna do is I wanna pull a couple of uh, things out and um, draw your attention to them. More, I wanna have a little bit of a zoom out and acknowledge that there has been really remarkable progress made even in the past two years, even during a pandemic. In my own laboratory, we were shut down for probably, and when I say shut down, we weren't entirely shut down. We were still doing essential work, but we were kind of significantly slowed down for just a few months. And then the team was back at it. The clinical trials group never, never slowed down. They continued a pace and had, uh, you, you almost couldn't tell that there was a pandemic uh, underway from what they were doing. One of the things that stands out in all of these disease specific group groupings of the um, kind of new, new projects, new advancements, research, clinical care is the strong international collaborations. And I wanna underscore that because um, it's a source of pride for me. And I think others in our scientific community, we're small, but one of the ways that we have the impact and make the kinds of advances that we do is by working together, understanding what your expertise is and how it complements my expertise and how together we might move, move a project forward much faster than e either of us could do alone um, or in competition with each other. And it's really a commitment to each other, to sharing resources, to talking science, uh, to supporting each other's work, to advocating for each other's work. I have advocated for funding uh, for other scientists in the community. And I think all of that um, has brought, uh, uh, ha has contributed to the, uh, to the advances that we've seen strong international collaborations for a rare disorder, any individual rare disorder or a group of rare disorders is a key element to, uh, to success. There are too few people otherwise, and we need more scientists worldwide working on these. So that's one of the things that I wanted to call out. I did wanna draw attention to the fact that there's a lot of work that happens, you know, it never gets published, and it never um, kind of reaches attention, but this is my chance to put it in front of you that we as a um, group of uh, care providers at OHSU do a lot of uh, firsthand uh, uh, care um, of, uh, uh, consultations with, uh, with clinicians who are struggling either with management or with trying to get to a diagnosis or there's something about the genetic test they didn't understand. They have an MRI and they're wondering whether they should test for an, MRI, an NBI disorder. There's a family um, in a country with a question that, we're, that nobody, none of the care providers in that co country can answer that wants to talk to us. We are, we are busy every week um, supporting the healthcare needs of people around the world. Uh, we have um, particularly Penny Hogarth has uh, the, the most extensive expert world, expertise worldwide in managing dystonic storm in PCAM. And her, her knowledge base and her experience is an extraordinary value to the community. 
And so I'm going to talk a little bit later about the fact that we don't want that locked in Penny's brain. We want that shared and downloaded and etched into stone and, and built on over the, over the years. But this is something that, you know, we've built over time and we recognize the value of it. And then I want to, before I move to the next slide, just call out Allison Gregory. You know, Allison has been um, a central part of the OHSU program for, I think it's 18 years now, if I'm remembering with a number, plus or minus, I think it's 18 years. Allison is a genetic counselor. Um, she's uh, incredibly bright and dedicated and accessible. Um, what you may not know about Allison, so there's Allison wears two hats. She wears a family facing hat and she wears a sort of scientific leadership hat. And Allison, so I, I get a lot of, um, you know, I get, I get credit for the OHSU program, but it is as, as much as it can be. It's a partnership uh, also with Penny, also with Allison, also with Sue, and really actually all, with all members of our team. There isn't anybody on our team who doesn't bring really exceptional expertise and, and kind of complementary skills, whatever they are, uh, to the team. Allison is as important to our team as any as anyone is. Without her, we wouldn't be able to serve the community in the ways that we do. And uh, we wouldn't be able to actually carry on the scientific work that we do. She is the lead on all of the, uh, all of the um, natural history studies. She conceived many aspects of them and she has been the um, kind of the driving force for for many of those, for the clinical trial, she is um, in, in partnership with Penny. She is helping to lead that trial. Really uh, kind of an amazing, uh, an amazing group. So maybe before I go to the next slide, I just want to, I, I just want to ask you all, I don't know how many people are, I don't, I don't see the participants list. I don't know how many people are watching, but I'm hoping it's more than 10. Um, I know it's more than 10. I'm gonna add, yeah, so let me ask you to just um, reflect for a moment. Have you ever spoken with Allison? Have you ever uh, emailed or, uh, I don't know if she texts with most families, maybe she does. Have you ever um, Skyped with Allison? Have you ever Zoomed with Allison? Have you ever talked to her on the telephone? I would be interested to know what fraction of those of you out there who are families with an NBI disorder, I would be interested to know how many of you have benefited uh, from Allison's um, expertise and services. I think she's one of the most important hubs in the network that is um, both our team, but also our community, our larger community. I think she's really a, um, she is a gem. Now, if she's not blushing, I haven't done my job. Okay, so where are we headed? Um, instead of focusing on individual disorders, I wanted to take a zoom out to maybe the 5,000 foot view and say, first of all, we've made astonishing progress in the last uh, two years. It's not astonishing, it's what we expect of ourselves. We've made excellent progress in the last uh, two years. We we had been beating this drum of uh, natural history studies. We've got them launched. Um, I learned this morning that uh, Sunita has, um, is well along uh, with the FON uh, uh, natural history study. The MPAN uh, community uh, led by scientists in Germany are, uh, are um, making excellent progress on a MPAN natural history studies. And then we have the OHSU led programs. As you heard from Dr. Sids, it cannot be overstated the importance for all therapeutics development to have a robust natural history study. And so this is a place where every individual family with an NBIA disorder can contribute. It doesn't cost you any money. It's simply a way to contribute to the research in a way that nobody else can, can do. So no, nobody else can do that. We need you to do that. We've got gene therapy projects going for three of the NIBA disorders. Um, my, my technical people made a misspelling there. Um, we've got new therapeutic ideas uh, for some of these disorders. You've just heard from uh, uh, Chukri, who's got some cool ideas. You've got heard some from Susie, 
uh, who's moving her, her set of molecules along. I think there's a lot to be um, excited for in the PLAN world. Um, in BPAN, we have a lot of work to do, but we have a lot of good ideas and we have an unparalleled, unmatched scientific community working on BPAN because autophagy is uh, a very, very uh, hot topic. Uh, Jenny Wilson from the OHSU team has um, led the development of a BPAN best practice guideline. We've circulated it to a group of experts and sought their expertise and input. It's in a late stage, almost about to be published. And when it is published, we will share it, of course, with all of you. Some family members from the community joined us in this effort and helped us and contributed really very valuable and important edits to the uh, to the draft before it was published. So thanks to those. We have one that we're about to begin, which is uh, INAD slash PLAN uh, best practice guideline that Jenny has also agreed to lead the charge on. She's, she's uniquely suited to doing this because she is a child neurologist, a developmental pediatrician. Uh, she's attended our NBIA clinic and now knows these diseases actually quite well. She has managed very intensively um, a young man with pecan and done so beautifully. She's an amazing advocate um, and she's a really good writer. So that's what you want in your uh, colleague doing this. So, so INAD, we've got pecan and BPAN done. INAD and slash PLAN um, is being teed up. We need to march through these and do the whole set. So that's the, that's the, uh, that's the goal. Can we go faster than we've been going? Um, absolutely, we can go faster. Um, in order for us to go faster, what's that going to take? It's going to take more people. So I can tell you that I can't go faster. Um, I can tell you that Penny and Allison can't go faster. Um, Chukri is going pretty fast. He may be able to go faster, but I'd be surprised. We need more people. We need a bigger scientific community. And what gets you here is you got to either be hooked by the diseases, or you have to be attracted either by the science or, or, or funding opportunities. And so I get to uh, ask this question uh, frequently, and I think it's helpful for people to understand the bald truth is that if there's a ton of money, people will come and, and contribute their ideas. The other thing that I think could accelerate our work, our field's work is, um, is enabling high risk, high reward science. So that's the kind of science where we maybe don't have uh, preliminary data that tells us this is gonna work if you just give us enough money to do the real experiments we're proposing to do. We've got enough preliminary data to show us, yeah, it's true and it's gonna work. We just need to, to do the bigger, uh, more complicated experiments. A lot of high risk, high reward science is big, vast kind of game changing ideas that could be a total flop. And so you have to be okay with the total flop idea if you're gonna flop you know, seven times for every one time that you hit it out of the park. So that's the, the, these are the kind of uh, uh, decisions that our, that our community makes. I did wanna make one uh, comment that in my, in my mind, so how old is the NBIA community? Well, it depends on when you start counting, right? Um, so, um, I wouldn't go back to 1922. I would not go back to 1922, which is when Hollerwurden and Spatz described uh, this disease that we now know as pecan. I would actually um, not even go back to when I got hooked, uh, but I'd actually go to when the PANK2 gene discovery um, happened. And Susie might reasonably disagree with that and think that, that the field actually should go back to uh, earlier when the pantothenate kinases were discovered or when their biology was known, but they hadn't been linked to a disease. And so I think that I, I, I sort of set the start of our field as when they were linked to a disease. And granted, with the pecan disease gene discovery, um, Susie had already been working on pantothenate kinase uh, proteins for many, many years, um, had contributed seminal uh, scientific ideas um, to the field. And much of that enabled a lot of the science to move much more quickly. But I sort of set us at around 2000 is when we found the gene, 2001 is when we published. So we're coming up on 20 years. 
we're just about uh, to be uh, legal adults and ready, able to drink. Some of us might think that we're 21. Yeah, we found the gene in 2000. Um, that might make sense too. That's a pretty short trajectory and it's really, it's helpful to frame it as such. I know that it's not fast enough. I know that a year is too long. I know that, but we are going pretty darn fast. That's, I guess, the point that I wanna make here. Okay, so um, what can you do? I want to empower you as individual families. And I wanna start by reminding you how I got here. And this uh, isn't all about me, except that it, during this hour, it kind of is all about me. Uh, not really. Um, I, I, was a, I was a physician in Buffalo, New York, uh, casting about for a project to keep me out of trouble. And I met a family uh, in, I think it was November, October, November, I'd just gotten there in July or August. Uh, I met them about three months after I'd gotten to uh, Buffalo and they had um, four daughters and three of their daughters had what we now know as pecan. This is an Amish family, which is why I'm showing you the horse and buggy uh, on the screen. Uh, this family was, it was very impactful to me. And the reason they were is that their daughters are, are, are living with a disease that you now all know, some of you more than you wish you knew. Uh, it's, a, it's very hard to sit in the room with somebody with pecan and not feel their distress. It's a very human response to the distress of a person uh, with pecan. And for me as a young, impressionable, a uh, physician looking for a project, it left a, a, an enduring um, impression on me. And I was very moved by not just the struggles, but also the joy that this family felt and the, the fact that they were uh, living without electricity, with, at a telephone. They were functioning um, beautifully as a family and very effectively as a family, uh, despite having a uh, really a very heavy burden in, in their family. And it was that family, um, the Millers, who who hooked me and sort of set me on this path uh, to studying these disorders. I, all I knew how to do as a scientist uh, was find a gene, find a disease gene. And I didn't even really know how to do that. Uh, this is before the genome project. It's back, you know, when everybody rode in horses and buggies. Not really, I'm not that old. Uh, it, it's back a ways um, scientifically, and, but, but I did know sort of the first steps uh, to take. And I knew with this one family, I didn't need any more pecan families. I, just with this one family, I could use their blood DNA to help find the gene. And of course, you know, the story thereafter, that was the family, their DNA was the DNA we used to discover the gene. And then we confirmed it in all the other families. And uh, the, and so it went. And I, I put this slide up because it's, it's uh, both moving for me to remember what got me here, um, but it's also in the clinical trial that Penny and Allison are running, there are five children from the Amish community who are enrolled in that, in that study. And that's coming full circle in a way that is very meaningful to us as a, as a team to see that they contributed at the front end and their community, maybe not the same individuals, but their community benefits um, over time. This is a coming full circle that was very moving to me. Sorry for the pixelated view here, but this is the best I could get of this other family. And I wanted to talk very briefly about another um, impactful pair of families, uh, the Stretters who are seen here with their son, Jonathan, and um, Aletta uh, Drummond and, and her daughter, Sarah Brooks, who in a um, coincidence that they couldn't have planned uh, at a NBIA disorders meeting somewhere between the East Coast and the West Coast, uh, we sat at a picnic, Penny and I, with, um, with the Stretters, and we heard their story in detail of, of Jonathan and how, how he, what he was like growing up and how um, things advanced for him. And then he had, he developed this brittle Parkinsonism and Penny um, and I both kind of lit up when we heard the story because it was starting to sound familiar. 
And it was really their um, spending time with us, bringing us into their family, talking to us about their path, their journey, and also um, the incredible advocacy of, of Aletta uh, Drummond, mother of Sarah Brooks, and her uh, coming to the meeting and teaching us about, uh, about, about Sarah and about this disorder that looked a whole lot like that thing that Jonathan uh, has. And so it was these two families who, who really um, lit a fire under us and got us organized around sending uh, a group of samples to, the, uh, to our German collaborators for the BPAN Gene Discovery Project. Um, I, I'm taking note of the fact that I'm having no trouble consuming an entire hour. So don't stay with me. Uh, coming full circle here is that the, uh, this family uh, so, so uh, using samples from um, Alet, uh, from Sarah and from Jonathan and others, the, our German collaborators uh, found the the BPAN gene, the WDR45 gene, and the first thing we did was turn it into a test at OHSU in the di the clinical diagnostic lab. We did that within a few weeks, I would say, maybe even less. And the first person who went through that testing was. Um, a family member was the Stretter's other son who does not have BPAN and had for, uh, for very understandable reasons been concerned that if he were to have children that he might have a risk of having a child with whatever this thing is that has disabled his brother. And we were able to um, provide testing for them. Uh, Allison did the genetic counseling and we were able to um, give them the good news that uh, there was no greater risk for his brother than for any of us to have a have a child with BPAN. And I do believe that that led to some grandchildren that we take personal responsibility for. And then I also want to make one more call out uh, to families here. I have noticed over the years that it is common and very understandable for families when their child or family member has died from one of the NBIA disorders, for them to, uh, for the grief to be too great for them to be able to remain in this community. And what I wanna say is that I see, I see you here at this meeting. So there's a handful of families here, maybe more than I even know. And I think you are incredibly courageous people. I wanna call you out particularly and I want to tell you that we need you. We need you very much in this community because you have a wisdom and an experience that we need. And so for those of you who have been brave and come back, I understand for those who, who haven't and who can't, I do understand that. But for those of, those of you who have, we are grateful to you. So thank you. Okay. Succession planning. Uh, none of us is going to live forever, uh, myself included, and we have become ever more cognizant of the need for succession planning. It's not just important in our laboratory group, it's important in the NBIA Disorders Association, in how we uh, care for the community, in ensuring that there's you know, new scientists and new physicians coming along, learning from the old guard and uh, leveraging whatever we can so that those who come after us can benefit from whatever it is we've learned and, and built and developed to take it then to the next, to the next steps. And so um, I wanna assure you that we, the OHSU group, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon that I know of. Um, I'm, I'm planning to continue my work as I've been doing. I am not retiring, I'm 62 and I'm very happy with uh, my work and intending to continue. I'm writing a five-year grant renewal right now and hoping it gets funded. And if it does, you, you, you can uh, put a stake in the ground and we'll talk in, in five years about uh, succession planning again. But it's really important not to be, you know, writing a will on your deathbed. It's important not to be planning when you're, you know, going into surgery. It's important to be planning well in advance when you have your head about you and your, 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 you're, you're able to think through the things that need thinking through. And so I wanna reassure the community, we are thinking about this. Um, this is a group 
decision, and it's not even just a group decision, the OHSU group, it's a, a bit of a community decision. It's also a university decision, right? Um, despite uh, what it might seem, I don't actually own anything in our research program. OHSU, my university owns everything. That's an um, interesting quirk of American universities. Um, but they're, you know, they're, they're interested in seeing the, the resources perpetuated and, and, and enabled in a way that serves others. So this is a, more than anything, it's a statement of, to reassure you that we are um, planning. We don't have an explicit plan at this stage. We're, we're exploring different options on any one of these fronts, but we are aware of the incredibly rich resources that we've built uh, both the literal things in our hands and also the data. Um, we want to be able to preserve those and enable their access in ways that, that facilitate the science for decades and, and beyond uh, to come. So there you have my reassurance on that front. Um, I talked at the last, uh, there's a sound of an ocean here. If that's what you think you're hearing, that is what you're hearing. I talked at the last meeting about this concern I had that we were at risk, we were kind of in a fragile place two years ago, and I was worried that we were going to uh, become fractured and broken off, and uh, you know, certain family groups would go and and sort of no longer see the value of staying together. And I don't know why this picture says it all to me, but this picture says it all to me that we're here together. I'll answer the question: We're here together because it's it's the right place to be. It's absolutely. I have no question, and it's not for any, any uh, uh, goals of my own, except to benefit the, the science and benefit the families that we belong together and that it is critically important that we stay together. Uh, we may think that we, we, we have different disorders, but there is so much about them that um, can teach us about others. So the science keeps us together, the clinical care, many of the same physicians take care of uh, kids with different NBIA disorders. Uh, if we were to, you know, fractionate off and, and have a, you know, a copan uh, family community, and and they left the NBIA disorders community, they would be super tiny, and they would lose out on the benefit of all of this amazing momentum that uh, that the NBIA disorders association has built over the years. It's an organizational momentum that cannot be underestimated you look at the picture of where we were in 2000 and yeah, we were not bad. That's not bad for a first meeting, but boy, have we come a long way since then. The individual disorders also teach us about other NBIA disorders. And I can't overemphasize this fact enough that what we will learn about MPAN will teach us about BPAN because there are aspects of the synucleinopathy that are, that are similar. And, what, and that also is relevant to PLAN. The biochemistry of uh, PECAN and FON and COPAN and MEPAN is intersecting in a way where one, what we learn about one disease teaches us about the others and potentially therapeutics for one may have utility um, in others. I know that we always have new families joining us between the sessions. And I do think it's important that the BPAN family community acknowledge and honor the fact that their gene discovery was funded by other families, also by BPAN families, the few who were in the NBIA Disorders Association, but also by many families um, who don't have BPAN. Why are we here together? We're here together. So we're a team. I think if you haven't, if you've learned nothing else about us, you've learned that we are really, um, I would say, cohesive, effective, complementary. Um, we, we, we also really like each other and we certainly respect each other. We, we all bring our own expertise to this effort. And that is, um, that is the amazing gift of this group. We have longevity, right? Uh, loyalty. Um, and that, that also is one of the things that makes us, uh, makes us what we are. And I wanted to show this picture. This is from the last family meeting. Uh, I don't know what the plans are for this family meeting, where we're going to meet up for the picture, but I'm sure there's a plan. Um, we're stronger and better together. If I haven't uh, convinced you of that, then maybe I haven't done my haven't done my job here. Some of the people who were in that first family meeting are still 
still here, uh, still with us, uh, which is a real testament to their uh, love for this organization and for this community and their belief in what you all are doing. So with that, I will wrap up.